I rented a secluded cabin in the woods of Oregon to work on my book. It was an old rustic place, perfect for the solitude I needed. As a writer struggling with a severe case of writer's block, I hoped the peace and quiet would spark my creativity. The Airbnb listing boasted about the serene environment and lush forests, which seemed ideal for my retreat. After a long drive, I arrived at the cabin in the late afternoon. The first thing I noticed were the strange symbols carved into the trees and painted on rocks around the property. They looked ancient, maybe Native American, I thought. I dismissed them as local folklore, more curious than concerned. The cabin itself was charming, with a cozy interior that immediately made me feel at home. Shortly after settling in, I received a welcome message from the host. Welcome, Jacob. Hope you enjoy your stay. Please remember to stay indoors after dark for safety reasons. Feel free to contact me if you need anything. The message was friendly but vague. Safety reasons. I shrugged it off, assuming it was just a precaution against wild animals. That night, as I was preparing dinner, I heard faint chanting in the distance. Curious, I stepped outside and saw distant torchlights flickering in the woods. It sent a chill down my spine but I convinced myself it was probably just a local event or celebration. I went back inside, locked the door, and tried to focus on my writing. The next night, the chanting returned, louder this time, and the torchlight seemed closer. The rhythmic voices and flickering flames were unsettling, but I tried to ignore them. However, my curiosity got the better of me, and I peeked through the window. To my horror, I saw a group of robed figures moving slowly through the trees, chanting in unison. My heart raced, and I quickly drew the curtains, retreating to the safety of the cabin. I messaged the host about the strange occurrences. Their reply was quick and cryptic. Don't worry, Jacob. It's just a local tradition. Nothing to be afraid of. Nothing to be afraid of? It was far from reassuring, but I had no choice but to accept it. The following night, the chanting was even louder, and the torchlights were now just beyond the edge of the clearing around the cabin. I stayed indoors, as advised, but my anxiety was growing. Around midnight, I heard footsteps outside. I peered through a crack in the curtains and saw the robed figures surrounding the cabin. They began a ritual, chanting louder and raising their torches high. Suddenly, one of them pulled out a struggling bound figure and forced them to kneel in the center of the circle. I watched in horror as a makeshift altar was set up, and the chanting reached a fever pitch. Before I could react, the robed leader produced a knife and with a swift motion, sacrificed the victim. I stumbled back from the window, my mind racing. I had to get out of there. I grabbed my phone and called the host, my voice trembling as I recounted what I had seen. The host's response was disturbingly calm. It's part of our tradition, Jacob. Please stay calm and stay indoors. Terrified, I decided to leave. I packed my things and rushed to my car, but the road was blocked by fallen trees. It was deliberate. There was no way it was a coincidence. Desperate, I tried to start the car, but it wouldn't start. Someone had tampered with it. I was trapped. I returned to the cabin, barricading myself inside. I noticed a trap door under the rug in the living room leading to a hidden basement. With no other options, I descended into the dark hoping to find a way out, or at least some place to hide. The basement was filled with cult artifacts, masks, robes, books with strange symbols, and an altar similar to the one outside. Panic set in as I realized the cabin wasn't just a rental. It was a sanctuary for the cult's leader. I had stumbled into their sacred ground. I needed to find a way to escape before they returned. Hours passed, and the chanting resumed above me. I could hear them searching the cabin. I stayed as quiet as possible, praying they wouldn't find the trap door. I noticed a small window high up on the basement wall, just big enough to crawl through. Gathering my courage, I climbed up and squeezed through the window, dropping into the cold night air outside. I ran through the woods, following the faint trails illuminated by the moonlight. I could hear the cultists behind me, their chanting growing louder as they realized I had escaped. My heart pounded as I pushed myself to keep running, the trees and underbrush tearing at my clothes and skin. Eventually, I found a road and flagged down a passing car. The driver, an elderly man, looked at me with concern as I breathlessly explained what had happened. 
he drove me to the nearest town, where I called the police. The authorities investigated the cabin, but by the time they arrived, the cult had vanished, leaving no trace behind. The symbols, the artifacts, and even the bodies were gone. The host, too, was nowhere to be found. The police dismissed my story as a figment of my imagination, a result of stress and isolation. I left Oregon, never to return. The experience haunted me, and I abandoned my book project, unable to shake the memories of that night. The symbols, the chanting, the sacrifice, it all stayed with me, a dark reminder of the horrors that lurk just beyond the edge of civilization. I rented out an Airbnb in Northern California for a much needed break. I don't go on many trips out of town, so this was one of the few times I've had to stay somewhere, other than a friend or family member's house. The area I needed to stay in was small, and most of the hotels didn't look very nice. To my surprise, there was a single home listed on Airbnb. It was my first time using the site, but the house looked like a decent place, much better than the hotels. I requested the dates, and in a few minutes the place was booked. The following week, I started the drive. When I got to the town, which was about 14 hours from my city, it was well into the night. The town almost looked deserted compared to where I was used to living. All the houses' lights were off, and all the stores were closed. No people or cars were out. Of course, it was the middle of the night, so I didn't expect this small town to be lit up and active at this time but it was still eerie considering I hadn't seen it during the day. I only came in with this as the first impression. The street that took me to the air bump was dark as well, leading through a winding, forested neighborhood until I eventually ended up at the house. It was one of few that had its porch and outdoor lights on, but one window upstairs had a light coming through it as well. I figured the last guest had just made the mistake of leaving it on, so I thought nothing of it and started getting my stuff up to the front door. I got the key code from my email and opened the door, getting inside and locking the door behind me. I quickly put my stuff in the corner of the room, then went upstairs to turn off the light that was left on. It was one of the spare bedrooms, only having a bed and a small dresser in it. I flicked it off, then went to the main bedroom to set up my things. I was only staying for one night, but had it booked for two because I needed to be there late into the following day. I was up for no more than an hour before finally getting in bed and turning in for the night. I rested my eyes and tried to sleep but was laying awake for a long time. I sat up quickly, hearing a thud run through the walls of the house. I stared at the door, trying to think what could have been the cause of the sound, but with no ideas coming to mind, I got up to check. I opened the door softly, peering into the upstairs hallway. It was dark and quiet now. No more thuds, only the sounds of the house swaying in the wind. I stepped back and quietly shut the door but a strange feeling came to me that had me wait as I thought more about the sound I heard. As I stood there, soft creaks started to go along the floorboards from the other room. I listened with my ear against the door as the creaking moved into the hallway and then began making its way toward the door. I was so in shock that I almost didn't realize that it had to be footsteps of someone approaching. My heart started racing as they came right up to the other side of the door. I put my hand tightly on the door handle to keep it from moving, and only a moment later, I felt it pull down. As soon as I resisted, they eased off. There was a small moment before suddenly the handle was forced down, and they slammed into the door. It swung half open before I pressed my body back into it. I only saw half of their face in the doorway, but in their eyes was an anger that I didn't expect to ever see. After a struggle, I somehow managed to push the door back into the latch and lock it. The man on the other side tried to get it back open, but after yelling a few unpleasant words towards me, he ran downstairs and out of the house. I was still catching my breath, and my mind was racing. But I gathered myself up and dialed 911. For such a small town, they came shortly after. The owner of the Airbnb continued with the case after I left the following day, but I wish I had kept up with it. That man seemed so desperate to get into my room and was in some state of rage like he wanted to hurt me as if I'd done something to him. Everything about it is disturbing and I don't think I'll ever get it out of my head, but Airbnbs probably won't be something I take part in again for a long time. 
I arrived at the cabin just as the sun was dipping below the horizon, casting a golden glow over the forested mountains. The Airbnb listing had promised tranquility and inspiration, and as I stepped out of the car and stretched, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The cabin was quaint, nestled between tall pine trees, with a breathtaking view of the mountains. Mrs. Porter, an elderly woman with a kind smile, met me at the door. She handed me the keys and gave a brief tour of the cabin, pointing out the essentials. As we stood on the porch, she gestured towards a patch of trees. There's an old house down that way, she said, her voice dropping to a whisper. It's abandoned and unsafe. Best to stay away from it. I nodded, promising to heed her warning. After she left, I unpacked and settled in, excited to start my writing project. As night fell, I heard strange noises outside, rustling leaves, twigs snapping, but I dismissed them as normal forest sounds. Exhausted from the drive, I went to bed early, unaware of the unease that would soon creep into my stay. I woke early, energized and ready to write. The cabin's cozy atmosphere was perfect for inspiration, and I made good progress on my project. In the afternoon, I decided to take a break and explore the surroundings. The air was crisp and fresh as I walked through the woods. I felt a strange sensation, as if someone was watching me. I shrugged it off, attributing it to my overactive imagination. However, as I approached the dilapidated house Mrs. Porter had warned me about, I heard faint whispers and footsteps behind me. Turning around quickly, I saw no one. My heart raced, and I hurried back to the cabin, locking all the doors and windows. The feeling of being watched lingered, casting a shadow over my evening. Despite my unease, I managed to get some writing done before going to bed. The next morning I noticed something odd. Items in the cabin had been moved. My laptop was not where I had left it, and a chair was slightly out of place. I tried to brush it off, but a sense of dread settled in my stomach. That night, the knocking on the windows began. Soft at first, then more insistent. My pulse quickened, but I forced myself to stay calm. Determined to uncover the source, I set up a camera in the living room, hoping to capture any unusual activity while I slept. Reviewing the footage the next morning, I felt a chill run down my spine. A shadowy figure moved around the cabin, pausing to stare directly into the camera for several minutes before disappearing. I felt a wave of nausea as fear gripped me. I called Mrs. Porter, but there was no answer. Panic rising, I contacted the local police. They arrived within the hour, inspecting the cabin thoroughly but finding no signs of forced entry. They suggested I might be imagining things due to isolation, but I knew what I had seen. That night, the noises returned, louder and more persistent. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, I decided to follow them. They led me to the basement, where I discovered a hidden door behind a stack of old boxes. The door opened to a narrow, dark tunnel. I hesitated my heart pounding, but then I stepped inside, driven by the need to uncover the truth. The tunnel connected to the abandoned house. Inside, I found clothes, food, and a wall covered in photographs of me, taken from inside the cabin. Terrified, I ran back to the cabin, my mind racing. When I reached the living room, Mrs. Porter was there, waiting for me. Mrs. Porter's face was grim, she revealed that her mentally unstable son had been living in the abandoned house and had become obsessed with me. Before I could react, he appeared, wild-eyed and furious. A struggle ensued and I barely managed to escape, driving frantically to the nearest town. The police were quick to respond, and both Mrs. Porter and her son were arrested. The ordeal was over, but the fear lingered. I returned home, deeply shaken. The experience had left scars that wouldn't heal easily. I decided to take a break from freelance writing and seek therapy to cope with the trauma. Just when I thought I could move on, a letter arrived with no return address. Inside was a single photograph of me, looking out the window of the cabin. The terror I thought I'd escaped came rushing back, leaving me with the haunting realization that some nightmares never truly end. I had been looking forward to the week-long conference in the bustling city for months. Renting a modern loft through Airbnb seemed like the perfect way to enjoy a change of scenery, 
and get some inspiration for my writing. The loft was everything I hoped for. Spacious, bright, and located in a vibrant neighborhood filled with cafes, boutiques, and street performers. On my first night, after a long day of networking and attending panels, I decided to unwind with a glass of wine on the balcony. As I gazed at the city lights, I noticed someone entering the building across the street. My heart skipped a beat. The woman looked exactly like me. Same dark hair, same height, even wearing a similar outfit. I blinked, convinced my tired eyes were playing tricks on me and dismissed it as a strange coincidence. The next morning I woke early, eager to explore the city before the conference resumed. I grabbed a coffee from the cafe on the corner and strolled through a nearby park. I froze when I saw her again, sitting on a bench, reading a book. She glanced up and our eyes met. A chill ran down my spine. The resemblance was uncanny. I turned quickly and walked away, feeling unnerved. As the days went by, I began to see the doppelganger more frequently. She seemed to be everywhere, at the conference, in the supermarket, even at the gym I visited one morning. Each time she was doing something I had done just hours before, wearing clothes eerily similar to mine. It was as if she was mimicking my every move. My unease grew. I started receiving strange messages and calls meant for her, containing cryptic and threatening content. One text read, You can't hide forever. We know what you did. Another voicemail warned, Leave now or face the consequences. My attempts to explain the situation to my friends were met with skepticism. They suggested I was overworked and stressed. One night there was a knock on the door. My heart raced as I approached, peering through the peephole. No one was there, but a package lay on the doormat. I brought it inside and opened it with trembling hands. Inside were photos of me, taken from a distance, capturing me doing everyday activities. There were pictures of me walking to the conference, sitting in the cafe, even lounging in the loft. Panic set in. Someone was stalking me. Desperate for answers, I confronted the building manager. I described the doppelganger and the unsettling occurrences. The manager looked puzzled and assured me that no one else resembling me was staying in the building or the neighborhood. He even offered to check the security footage, but found nothing unusual. That night, the doppelganger appeared inside my loft. I was brushing my teeth when I saw her in the mirror, standing behind me, mimicking my movements exactly. I spun around, but she vanished. I searched the loft, every corner, every closet, but found nothing. My mind was unraveling and I questioned my own sanity. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I researched the history of the loft. I discovered that the previous tenant, a woman named Sarah, had a similar experience. Sarah had documented everything in a journal, which I found hidden behind a loose brick in the wall. She wrote about seeing her doppelganger, receiving threats, and eventually disappearing under mysterious circumstances. The last entry read, She's getting closer. I can't escape her. Decided to set up a camera to capture evidence of the doppelganger. I positioned it in the living room, aimed at the spot where I had seen her before. That night, she appeared again. I watched in horror as she walked into view of the camera, stared directly into the lens, and then disappeared. He next morning, I checked the footage, but she was not there. My paranoia reached its peak. I barely slept, kept all the lights on, and avoided mirrors. I knew I had to find a way to break free from this nightmare. I returned to Sarah's journal hoping for a clue. Buried in the final pages was a mention of a ritual, a way to banish the doppelganger. The instructions were cryptic, involving a series of steps that had to be performed at midnight. I gathered the items needed, a mirror, a candle, and a piece of my own clothing. As the clock struck twelve, I began the ritual, following the steps meticulously. I lit the candle, stared into the mirror, and chanted the incantation from the journal. At first, nothing happened. Then the air grew cold, and the flame flickered. The doppelganger appeared in the mirror, her eyes filled with malice. My reflection warped and she stepped out of the mirror, reaching for me. 
Summoning all my courage, I completed the final step of the ritual, burning the piece of clothing while reciting the last line of the incantation. She screamed, a chilling sound that echoed through the loft. She dissolved into smoke, sucked back into the mirror. The glass shattered, and the room fell silent. I collapsed to the floor, exhausted, but relieved. I had done it. The curse was broken. The next day, I left, vowing never to return. Contacted the Airbnb host, explaining that I had to leave early due to personal reasons. I never mentioned the doppelganger or the ritual, fearing they would think I was insane. I moved to a new city, far away from the haunting memories of that week. I resumed my writing, channeling my fear and experiences into a novel that became an instant bestseller. Yet, every now and then, I would catch a glimpse of a familiar face in a crowd, or see a shadow that seemed too familiar, and a shiver would run down my spine. I knew the doppelganger was gone, but the trauma lingered, a reminder of the thin veil between reality and the supernatural. I learned to live with the shadows, using my story as a cautionary tale of the dangers that lurk in the most unexpected places. I rented an Airbnb in a small town in the Midwest for a week-long getaway. I wanted to escape the hustle and bustle of city life, and the quaint, quiet town seemed like the perfect place. The house was charming and situated at the end of a cul-de-sac, surrounded by thick woods. It looked like an idyllic retreat from the photos on the listing. I arrived in the late afternoon. The sun was setting, casting a warm glow over the town. The house was even more charming in person, with its white picket fence and neatly trimmed lawn. I parked my car in the driveway, grabbed my bags, and headed inside. The host had left a key under the doormat just as they had mentioned in the check-in instructions. The interior of the house was cozy, with rustic furniture and a fireplace in the living room. After settling in, I decided to take a walk around the neighborhood to stretch my legs and get a feel for the place. As I strolled down the quiet streets, I noticed an elderly man sitting on his porch next door. He waved me over with a friendly smile. Hello there. You must be the new guest staying at the Airbnb, he said. Name's Henry. Lived here my whole life. Hi, I'm Alex, I replied, shaking his hand. Yes, I'm staying here for the week. It's a beautiful town. Henry nodded. It is. Quiet and peaceful, just the way we like it. Not many visitors come around here, though. You're one of the few. We chatted for a while, and Henry told me stories about the town's history and the people who lived there. He seemed like a kind old man, full of interesting anecdotes. But then, he mentioned something that piqued my curiosity. You know, there's been some strange occurrences with that Airbnb you're staying at, he said, lowering his voice. A few guests have come and gone, but some, well, they just vanished. No one knows what happened to them. I felt a chill run down my spine. Vanished? What do you mean? Henry sighed. It's hard to explain. They checked in just like you did, but never checked out. Their cars were left behind, but they were gone. No trace of them. I tried to brush off the unease that was creeping up on me. That sounds like something out of a horror movie, I said with a nervous laugh. Henry didn't laugh. Just be careful, Alex. Keep your wits about you. I thanked him for the warning and headed back to the Airbnb, my mind racing with thoughts of the missing guests. I tried to focus on enjoying my vacation, but Henry's words lingered in my mind. That night I had trouble sleeping. Every creak of the house and rustle of the trees outside seemed amplified in the silence. I told myself it was just my imagination running wild, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The next morning, I decided to do some research. I visited the local library and looked up any news articles about missing persons in the town. To my surprise, there were indeed several reports of people who had disappeared over the past few years all of whom had been staying at the same Airbnb. The cases were eerily similar. Guests checked in, but never checked out, leaving behind all their belongings. I returned to the house, my curiosity now fully piqued. I decided to take a closer look around the property. As I explored the backyard, I noticed a small shed tucked away in the corner, almost hidden by overgrown bushes. The door was slightly ajar and a padlock hung loosely from the latch. 
With a sense of foreboding, I pushed the door open and stepped inside. The shed was filled with old tools and gardening supplies. But what caught my eye was a stack of boxes in the corner. I opened one of the boxes and found personal items, clothing, toiletries, and even a few wallets. My heart pounded as I realized these must have belonged to the missing guests. I took out my phone and snapped some pictures, planning to show them to the police. As I was about to leave the shed, I heard footsteps approaching. I quickly hid behind a stack of crates, my breath shallow and my heart racing. The footsteps stopped outside the shed, and I heard the familiar voice of my host, Mark. I know you're in there, Alex, he called out, his tone menacing. You shouldn't have gone snooping around. I felt a surge of panic. How did he know I was there? I tried to stay as still as possible, hoping he would leave. But Mark stepped inside the shed, his eyes scanning the room until they landed on me. There you are, he said with a cold smile. You've seen too much. Before I could react, Mark lunged at me. I tried to fend him off, but he was much stronger than he looked. He pinned me to the ground and pulled out a syringe from his pocket. I struggled, but he managed to inject me with a sedative. My vision blurred, and darkness closed in around me. The last thing I heard was Mark's voice, whispering in my ear. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. When I woke up, I was in a small, windowless room. My hands and feet were bound, and I had no idea where I was. Panic set in as I realized the gravity of my situation. I had to find a way out. I struggled against the ropes, but they were tied tight. Desperation fueled my efforts, and after what felt like hours, I managed to loosen the knots enough to free my hands. I untied my feet and stood up, my legs shaky. The room was bare except for a single door. I pressed my ear against it, listening for any sounds outside. Hearing nothing, I slowly turned the knob and peeked out. The hallway was empty, and I could see a staircase leading up. I crept down the hall and up the stairs, trying to be as quiet as possible. As I reached the top, I found myself in the main part of the house. It was eerily quiet, and I could see the front door just a few feet away. Summoning all my courage, I made a run for it. I burst through the front door and sprinted to my car, fumbling for my keys. As I started the engine, I saw Mark running out of the house, shouting at me to stop. I didn't look back. I sped down the street, my hands trembling on the wheel. I drove straight to the police station and reported everything. The police took my statement and assured me they would investigate. A few days later, I received a call from the police. They had arrested Mark and found more evidence linking him to the disappearances of the other guests. It turned out he had been running a kidnapping ring, using the Airbnb to lure unsuspecting travelers. The news shook me to my core. I couldn't believe how close I had come to becoming another one of his victims. The experience left me traumatized, and it took me a long time to feel safe again. I never used Airbnb again after that. The memories of that week still haunt me, and I can't help but think of the other guests who weren't as lucky as I was. Henry's warning had been more than just a story. It had saved my life. My best friend Josh and I had been planning our weekend getaway for months. We needed a break from our stressful jobs, and the idea of renting a secluded farmhouse in the countryside seemed perfect. The photos on Airbnb showed a charming, rustic home surrounded by rolling hills and dense woods. It looked like the ideal place to relax and unwind. We arrived at the farmhouse on a Friday afternoon. The drive had been long, but the scenery was beautiful. As we pulled up the gravel driveway, the house came into view. It was just as picturesque as the photos had suggested. We parked the car, grabbed our bags, and headed inside. The interior was cozy and welcoming with exposed wooden beams and a large stone fireplace. After unpacking, we decided to explore the property. There was a small barn out back, a chicken coop, and a sprawling meadow that led into the woods. The air was fresh, and the only sounds were the chirping of birds and the rustling of leaves. That evening, we sat on the porch with beers in hand, watching the sun set over the horizon. It was peaceful, and for the first time in weeks, I felt truly relaxed. As darkness fell, we headed inside to make dinner. The kitchen was well stocked, and soon the aroma of cooking filled the air. 
After dinner, we decided to watch a movie. We settled into the living room, and I noticed that our phones had no signal. Guess we really are in the middle of nowhere, Josh said, laughing. Yeah, but that's the point, right? No distractions, I replied, trying to ignore the slight unease I felt at being so cut off. The first strange noise came around midnight. We were halfway through our movie when we heard a faint thud coming from outside. Josh paused the movie, and we both listened intently. The noise didn't come again, so we shrugged it off and resumed watching. An hour later, just as we were about to head to bed, we heard it again, this time louder and closer. It sounded like something hitting the side of the house. We exchanged nervous glances. I'll go check it out, Josh said, grabbing a flashlight. I followed him to the front door, and we stepped outside. The air was cool, and the night was pitch black except for the beam of Josh's flashlight. We walked around the house, scanning the area. Everything seemed normal, and we couldn't find anything that could have caused the noise. Probably just an animal, Josh said, though he didn't sound entirely convinced. We went back inside, locked the doors, and headed to our respective bedrooms. I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to shake the feeling that something wasn't right. Eventually, exhaustion took over, and I fell asleep. I woke up to the sound of footsteps. They were faint but unmistakable, coming from somewhere inside the house. I glanced at my phone, still no signal. Heart pounding, I crept out of bed and opened my door just enough to peer into the hallway. Josh was already there, looking as alarmed as I felt. You heard it too, I whispered. He nodded. Stay here, I'll check it out. No way, I'm coming with you, I insisted. We moved quietly down the hall, checking each room. The farmhouse was eerily silent, but the sense of unease grew stronger. When we reached the living room, Josh's flashlight beam caught something that made my blood run cold. The front door was wide open. We locked that, Josh said, his voice tight with fear. Before I could respond, we heard another noise, this time from the kitchen. It sounded like someone rifling through drawers. We ducked behind the couch, trying to come up with a plan. We need to get out of here, I whispered to the car. Josh nodded, and we started to move toward the back door, hoping to avoid whoever was in the kitchen. As we reached the door, I glanced back and saw a shadowy figure moving in the hallway. My heart raced, and I urged Josh to hurry. We burst out the back door and sprinted to the car. Josh fumbled with the keys, and my heart sank as I saw the headlights flash but no engine start. It's not working, he said, panic in his voice. Try again, I urged, but it was no use. The car wouldn't start. We looked back at the house, seeing the figures step out onto the porch, illuminated by the porch light. There were more of them, three, maybe four men, all dressed in dark clothes. We need to hide, I said, pulling Josh toward the barn. We dashed inside and closed the door as quietly as we could. The barn was dark and musty, filled with old tools and hay bales. We found a ladder leading to the loft and climbed up, hoping it would be a safe place to hide. We sat in the dark, listening to the sounds of footsteps outside. I prayed they wouldn't find us. My mind raced with thoughts of what they wanted and why they were here. The realization that our phones had no signal felt even more ominous now. Suddenly, the barn door creaked open. I held my breath, clutching a rusty pitchfork I'd found. The intruder's flashlight swept across the barn, and I could hear them talking in low voices. They must be around here somewhere, one of them said. Find them. The footsteps grew closer and I felt a surge of panic. I looked at Josh, who was gripping an old shovel, his face pale. We had to do something. As the intruders began climbing the ladder, I knew we had to act. I swung the pitchfork at the first man's head, knocking him off balance. He fell with a thud, and Josh hit the second man with the shovel. The other two scrambled back, shouting in surprise. Run! I yelled, and we bolted down the ladder and out of the barn. We sprinted toward the woods, the sounds of our pursuers close behind. My lungs burned, and my legs felt like they would give out, but we kept running. We finally reached a small clearing and collapsed, trying to catch our breath. The night was eerily silent again, but we could hear the distant shouts of the intruders searching for us. We need to keep moving, Josh said, pulling me to my feet. We have to find help. 
We stumbled through the woods, guided only by the moonlight. After what felt like hours, we saw lights in the distance. A farmhouse. We made our way to the house, pounding on the door and praying someone would answer. An elderly couple opened the door, their faces filled with concern. We quickly explained what had happened, and they let us inside, locking the door behind us. The woman handed us a phone, and for the first time, I felt a glimmer of hope as I dialed 911. The police arrived within minutes, and we led them back to the farmhouse. The intruders were gone, but the evidence of their break-in was clear. The officers took our statements and assured us they would investigate. Exhausted and shaken, Josh and I were taken to a nearby motel to spend the rest of the night. We didn't sleep, too haunted by the events of the night. The next day, we retrieved our belongings from the farmhouse and headed back to the city. The police later informed us that the intruders were part of a gang targeting isolated vacation homes. They had been watching us from the moment we arrived, cutting off our phone signal and sabotaging our car. It was a chilling reminder of how vulnerable we were in that secluded place. The experience left us both traumatized, and it took a long time for us to feel safe again. We never spoke of returning to that farmhouse, and our weekend getaways were forever changed. The memory of that night remains a stark reminder of how quickly a peaceful retreat can turn into a fight for survival. I rented an old, charming house in a historic district for a romantic getaway with my girlfriend, Emily. We were both history buffs, so staying in a place with a rich past was exciting. Upon arrival, we were greeted by an overly friendly but peculiar elderly neighbor named Mr. Thompson. He eagerly shared stories about the house's dark history, including a famous unsolved murder that took place there decades ago. Back in the 1920s, a young woman named Clara was found dead in this very house. They never caught the killer, he said with a gleam in his eye. We thanked him for the information, though it made us slightly uneasy. We brushed it off as part of the house's charm. The first night, as we were getting ready for bed, we heard unsettling noises, creaks and groans that seemed to come from within the walls. Old houses make noise, I reassured Emily, though I wasn't entirely convinced myself. The shadows cast by the flickering street lamp outside seemed to dance eerily on the walls. The next day, we decided to explore the attic. Amidst the old furniture and dusty boxes, we found an old diary. It belonged to Clara, the woman who was murdered. Her entries were filled with paranoia, describing how she felt someone was always watching her. I saw him again today, lurking outside my window. One entry read. Emily shivered as she read it aloud. That night, the noises grew louder, and we started finding messages written in the dust on surfaces, warning us to leave. Get out, was scrawled on the bathroom mirror, and he's here, was etched into the dust on the kitchen counter. Fear began to set in but we tried to rationalize it. Maybe it was just our minds playing tricks on us. Around midnight, we were startled awake by the sound of the back door creaking open and footsteps in the hallway. My eyes widened, and I grabbed the baseball bat I had brought just in case. Emily clung to me, trembling. Gathering my courage, I swung the bedroom door open and was met with nothing but an empty hallway. We decided to stay up for the rest of the night, taking turns keeping watch. Around 3 a.m., we saw Mr. Thompson standing inside our house, holding a candle. I'm here to protect you, he whispered. The killer still roams these parts. Emily and I exchanged a horrified glance. You need to leave, I said, my voice shaking. Mr. Thompson insisted he was there to help, but his presence only made things worse. We decided to leave immediately. We packed our bags and rushed out to our car, but it wouldn't start. Panic set in. Mr. Thompson stood on his porch, watching us with a strange smile. You can't escape him, he called out. Desperate, I dialed the police. They arrived within minutes, and Mr. Thompson retreated into his house. The police managed to jumpstart our car and followed us to a nearby motel. We spent the night there, too terrified to sleep. The next day, we contacted the Airbnb host and told them everything. They were shocked and promised to investigate. Weeks later, we learned that Mr. Thompson had a history of mental illness and was indeed the prime suspect in Clara's murder. He had been living next door for years, 
convincing himself he was protecting others from a non-existent killer. Emily and I never returned to that house, but the memory of that terrifying night still haunts us. The charm of history was replaced with a chilling reminder that some pasts are better left undisturbed.